Hello everyone and welcome to the next episode of the Blabbing Translators. This is the first live talk show about translators and translation. We talk about all sorts of subjects here from marketing to working with self-published authors to go into conference and a lot more. With me today is my wonderful co-host Dmitry Konyhov. Hello Dmitry. Hi everyone. And I'm very excited to introduce our guest today. Um, it's Tess Witte. Uh, Swedish to uh, Swedish English, sorry, <laughs> English to Swedish translator. You probably know her, but still, Tess, please introduce yourself. Thank you, um, Elena and Dmitri. Um, um, yes, uh, you said my name is is Tess Whitty. I am a, a, a Swedish expatriate living in the United States. I worked as a freelance translator since 2003. But before that, I worked with marketing as a marketing manager. And I had mar I studied marketing and languages at university. Um, I have um, a podcast also, Marketing Tips for Translators, uh, and a book called Marketing Cookbook for Translators. And um, yeah, it's better if you ask you questions. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I have a first question for you. Uh, the topic of our conversation actually is uh, diversification and how can a translator diversify, diversify uh, their income streams. And you're probably one of those translators who pretty much excelled at this kind of thing. Uh, you have a podcast, you have a book, uh, you also have a translation business and a coaching business. So uh, my, my first question is, how did you uh, came to the idea that you need to diversify your income? Well, I wasn't really thinking about my income. It just sort of grew organically. In the beginning, I was thinking that, OK, I have these marketing skills and they work well for me. So I will share them with other translators. So I started presenting at conferences and doing webinars and that went well. And it sort of grew from there. It wasn't intentional to, uh, to OK, I need another income. It was mm -hmm. sort of, I'm going to share my knowledge. And uh, I, I enjoy helping other, other translators. So that's how it all started. And when, when did it first start? It? To present and give webinars, maybe 2009 or 10. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, through and American Translators Association. And what about uh, the podcast? Okay, so after a while I, I i discovered that i really enjoyed this and it was really fun to 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 share the knowledge and to help so and i started listening to a lot of podcasts myself because i don't have i sit in front of the computer a lot during the day and i don't have <clears throat> much time to read all the blogs anymore even if i do enjoy them i i i don't have much time for that and i noticed that I do consume a lot of content by listening to it. I listen to audiobooks and I listen to other podcasts. So I decided that that would be a good, good medium to share more tips about how to market translation services and interpretation services. So that's, that's sort of what I, I, I was like, okay, let's try this. And a lot of people, and I, I, I didn't want to just share my knowledge. I wanted to bring to, together all other translators mm -hmm. and, and experts' knowledge and just share that to the translation and interpretation community. So that's how it started. So did you know anything about the technical side of podcasting when you first uh, had this idea or was it something completely new to you? No. I had no idea, but mm -hmm. I sort of got into the online business community and there was this this guide um, about how to start a podcast and it was a step-by-step -step guide and I just followed that. Mm. And, and what were the, uh, the first difficulties you, you had when you were just starting out as a, as a podcaster? To learn the technology maybe. Mm-hmm. 
was the first difficulty and it's always um sort of hard to know what content to to share and and to get people to interview and um and then the, the, for the technical part, it's to edit the podcast. Do you do it yourself or did you, did you do it yourself or did you outsource it from the very beginning? I did it myself in the beginning. I wanted to learn to see how it's done and I don't edit mm -hmm. very much. I try to edit, um, not edit so much. And then when I had learned it, I discovered that it was so easy that I could use my son to edit it. And so, I, mm. so I paid him to do it. And uh, oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then he got tired of it. And then my daughter continued and they're teenagers, they're busy. So I, when it was, came to the point when I said, Oh, I have these podcasts you need I need edited now. Can you do them? And they didn't have time. Then I, then I finally decided that I needed to outsource it mm. to someone else. And how, how much time does it normally take to produce one podcast? I haven't really timed myself, but at least an hour, because first I have to find the, the interviewee or the mm -hmm. subject for my every 10 podcasts is a solo episode. And then I need to create the questions, look at the material and create the questions and then schedule the podcast. And then the actual recording. Well, it I, I would say more like two hours actually, because the actual recording takes um, a, up to an hour to connect beforehand and explain stuff and to do the interview and, to, and afterwards. And then, then after that, we, it's the sound editing of the podcast to cut in the intro, the outro and the sponsors and to sound edit and upload it to the host service and to create the show notes and post those. So I guess, yeah, at least two hours per episode. Mm. but it's a labor How of love <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely it's basically the same with blabbing translators because it's something we haven't been do doing it for uh, for a long time but it's something i really enjoy but on the other hand we share the responsibility so dmitry is in charge of the technical all the technical stuff like uploading uh, the video and audio recording that sort of thing he also created our website and I'm in charge of uh, inviting the guests and all pre-episode communication, if I may call it so. And uh, we actually come up with the questions together usually. It's very inter mm -hmm. interesting yeah. to compare the compare uh, the processes, <laughs> different processes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how do you schedule? How do you schedule uh, the recordings? Do you do them batches? Or do you do, do do them one episode per per day or per week or how does it go? It just depends on when how much time I have and how much when when the person I'm interviewing has time. Mm -hmm. So I don't really schedule, um, but like right now I'm doing two to three per week, sort of, to fill up the summer, and then I won't do anything during the summer um, mm -hmm. while I'm traveling to Sweden. And uh, yes, but there's never a moment when I don't have anything scheduled sort of for the next week. Because that would <laughs> so stress me much, out. You're pretty much all, 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 always busy with podcasts, right? Yes, yes. And going back to your early days of podcasting, how did you promote your podcast? Because it, this was probably something very new, something unique for the translation industry. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering, uh, did, did it go viral or was it a slow start? Um, I guess maybe something in between. Maybe it was slow. Um, surprise, it went surprisingly well. I, I did create a website for it and uh, a Facebook page and I promoted it on all social media and then the, the people that I interviewed started sharing it too. So it sort of grew organically that way and then the awards from the community awards from from pros also helped and 
now I have about, well, about a thousand something, depending on the subject and the interviewee and, and stuff, the, about a thousand downloads per episode at least. Hmm. How do you choose your guests or how did you use your guests back then when you were just getting started? Um, I, I knew, I knew what I wanted to focus on, which was marketing tips. So I started looking for other experts or translators in, in, in the business that, that share their knowledge too. And I asked if I can interview them and every once in a while I hop onto some, I had an, uh, an episode where I, I also interviewed authors and they were not related to the translation industry and but but they they had could share a lot of good information like the the wealthy freelancer author co-author ed gandia i'm looking at the book here and uh, <laughs> get clients now cj hayden and the do it guy get it done guy uh steve robbins and so I should probably do more books because those were very interesting, fun too, and well received. Yeah, I remember the episode with Ed Gandia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it was, yeah, it was great and full. Of, I think I also uh, learned about uh, Ed Gandia from your podcast. I discovered it a year ago, probably later than <laughs> some of other translators. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there were a lot of interesting people I uh, got to know from the, those interviews. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm, good. I'm glad yeah. you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you for making it. <laughs> yeah, same here. Uh, Ed Gandia, also very good, uh, very good marketer. And I learned a great deal both from your podcast. And I also went over to his website and I think I signed up for his course or something like that mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. uh, warm email marketing. It was mm -hmm. actually quite, quite helpful, mm -hmm. uh, very helpful. So uh, I can definitely recommend it to anyone who is trying to uh, find a new clients using email techniques because it's mm -hmm. very helpful mm -hmm. yeah so so thank you for you so this this is a this is why i love uh, side projects uh, like this because uh they start from scratch and uh, they end up helping people and connecting people in multiple ways mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, uh, an amazing way to share knowledge and uh, bring a little bit of value to the community so uh, my next my next question is about your book. Uh, you also the author of a very great book about marketing. So how how did you end up writing this book? Uh, was it something you always wanted to do, or uh, was it something that you decided to do after your podcast? Uh, I, it has been on my bucket list, but I mm -hmm. haven't really known what to write about or what to share. And it was sort of at the same time I got the idea of the, the podcast that I got the idea for the book um, to, to, to share my marketing knowledge sort of in a, in a practical way to other translators in book format and focus on the marketing aspect. So, um, and the name, I, I think I was listening to a, another podcast and they said, what's your recipe for success? And talking about recipes um, in in sort of a business format, and I was like, that that's a good format. I can share them as recipes, so that uh, in the book you don't need to read it from cover to cover. It starts with the basics for the beginners, and it, then it advances to more expert cooks, so <laughs> to speak. And you can just pick the recipe you want to focus on, whether it's LinkedIn. You can pick that recipe and follow sort of the steps, uh, what to do or the tips for mar for marketing on LinkedIn. and Or you can pick networking or, or, or your CV or your, your cover letter or how to, con to find direct clients or, and, and stuff like that. So it starts with the basics, which are appetizers and the desserts are sort of the, the, the cherry on, on, on top of the cake, sort of work-life balance, time management, and so forth. How long did it take you to write the book? How did you about, organize work, work on it? About a, a year from starting to collect the material and, and, and 
creating a structure to writing and I, I had I, I had to plan and say I'm gonna write this many hours per week. So whether it was an hour every day or if it was on a on a weekend several hours, I just decided to do that. And um, and then I after I was done writing I, I hired a different editor or I think a, a couple of editors. Hmm. So how did you find them? Online. I think I used, it's called Upwork now. It used to be Odesk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a big, so. a big freelance, mm -hmm. freelance job site. Yeah. I thought I would give other freelancers jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I also found my, my um, designer, the cover designer, and, and mm -hmm. I got help with the layout there too. Do you outsource any other tasks apart from editing and cover design? For the book? Yeah. No. The layout? Mm, the layout, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you self-published self -published it, as yes. far as I know. Why, yeah. why did you decide to self-publish? Were there any other uh, options? Because it's really hard to um, market market to publishers and sell your idea and all the other authors in the industry that I know have self-published so that seemed to be the easiest solution mm -hmm. um, yeah and and uh, Amazon create space makes it so easy mm -hmm. very easy so the and uh, how did you launch your book uh have you been preparing your audience for the upcoming launch of the book or uh, was it just you, you publish an article and here, here it is, I have a book? <laughs> I, I did try to prepare my audience. I had an, you know, I had the, an email list or, or a newsletter for, for the podcast mm -hmm. and uh, I shared it on social media and asked for input on like the cover design and the name on, on social media. Um, and then I also wrote some guest posts for other blogs, but I, I am sure I could have done a lot more for the launch, but I just did as much as I had time, time and, and knowledge to do so at the time. Probably when you have uh, several side projects time, is the most precious resource and a lot of things depend on how much time you have, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it does. So how do you, how do you manage your time, uh, between your, uh, podcast, uh, coaching business and translation business, which one is, uh, takes the most of your time? Mm, I think the, the translation business takes the most time. And, and it has to still take the most time. That's sort of the income producing part. Um, but I do spend a few hours every day on, 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 on the podcast and the marketing and coaching and training business. And because I, I, I truly enjoy it. And that's sort of, what keeps me motivated to, because it's, I do two different things. I'm just not sitting and translating the whole time. So it gives me more energy and, and probably yes. <laughs> also a lot of opportunities to talk to other translators. The podcast, that's what I love the most mm -hmm. about the podcast, the opportunity to talk to so many other people mm -hmm. like we do today. Yes. It's, it's a pleasure. And, uh, um, I have started outsourcing. I started outsourcing even before I had uh, any any sort of side business. I started outsourcing. First of all, I started outsourcing my accounting because that's something I really I'm not good at and I don't enjoy it and it takes so much time. So that's my first thing to go. And then I then um, we live in the mountains in a in a fairly big house and uh, I just discovered that. The whole I don't want to spend every weekend cleaning it, so I started outsourcing the cleaning. So I can, if you when you start thinking about how much money you can earn during that time doing your translation or other business, 
then it, it's not so difficult to outsource anymore because you will earn more during that time, sort of, so to speak, or spend time relaxing with your family. And now, um, five years later, I or more, I I, I hired a. I have a part-time virtual assistant. Hmm. And what does she, what does she help you with, or he? Is it everything? <laughs> Well, I, I, she now does the sound editing and mm. the, for the podcast and posting everything online and finding the images and putting in links and doing the SEO. And she's also sort of creating a, a social media marketing schedule for me. I am, I have um, test launched a new course. I have a, a new course, an online course for um, the marketing course for translators. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just launched last week mm -hmm. and for a test audience of nine people for, for a special price. And so she helped me um, edit the videos, uploading the videos, creating PDF material. And um, she helped me a lot with the course mm. too. So what else does she help me with? She does some market research, some website updates, website updates. And it's, it's amazing. It's, it's such a relief. It's such a time saver. I send her the tasks in the evening and they're done when I wake up the next day. Hmm. That sounds like magic. <laughs> yes, yes. I think I, I, I need one of those. <laughs> or maybe a, maybe a couple of assistants because between my mm -hmm. several several projects, uh, I'm really torn apart because I have to do so, so many things. Mm -hmm. I've, I've only had her part time for for a month and a half, but mm. so far I really really appreciate her. And where did you find her in case someone else wants to try that option? This is also a resource I found online through all these podcasts. Um, it's called the Virtual Staff Finder. Mm -hmm. And um, if you, if you, if, and she's actually based in the Philippines, which mm -hmm. works best for 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 both of us and and that's sort of the only way you can find filipinos they're very hard working they're very good at english also i don't use her for proofreading though and and i pay her a good salary in in filipino mm -hmm. standards so mm -hmm. so that's i i use the virtual staff finder because they do it all for you you just say i would like someone that knows how to do this and this and this and this and then mm -hmm. then I interview um, I got three candidates that I interviewed and and then you pick one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see we've got a question from Olga Bonder and uh, mm -hmm. she's asking what was the most successful marketing strategy strategy for you to attract direct clients since I don't live where my direct clients live I cannot really go. I think for m many people, networking in person is the best one. But for me, it is online networking. And my website has done wonders for me. Many good direct clients have found me through my website. Um, and now I am sort of putting more focus on LinkedIn to try and connect on LinkedIn. I did that, for example, uh, when I used the Get Clients Now program, it's a 28-day program. I did it only through LinkedIn, and, and um, I got a lot of contacts through that. So that's my best marketing strategy. My website mm. would be would be the number one. Um, but, probably, but, probably SEO as well. Yeah. So yes. the website should be op but that, optimized. But that's that's sort of indirect marketing to to just have people find you but mm. if for direct marketing i can do more active finding people on linkedin and on twitter for example and by being active in in, in groups there mm. or groups on, on linkedin mm. that has to do with 
Swedish Imports, Swedish American Chamber of Commerce, um, marketing and, and software localization and, and so forth. How can you be active in those groups? Do you share some uh, interesting articles or you just uh, answer comments or something like that? Yes, and I, I am not, I'm sporadically active. I should be more system, <laughs> I should be more systematic, but uh, I, I just do what, what I can when I can. And if I find a good article to share, I, uh, I share that in the group. And I try to blog a little bit about, about Swedish translations and translation mm -hmm. quality and how to purchase translations and the business climate in Sweden and so forth on my website too. Mm. So you're also writing articles uh, that are geared towards your potential clients who might be interested in buying your mm -hmm. translation services. Yes, but not as much as I would like to <laughs> or as often I would like to. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, let me read another question from Olga. Uh, how do you convert your LinkedIn contacts into clients? Mm, you sort of just... So, um... To convert LinkedIn contacts into clients, that's that's the if you know that that's the magic, I guess. You uh, just have to create a relationship with them. You can follow them and share information and resources, and um, and when you've sort of um, created a system where they sort of know about you, and then you can always contact them directly and ask if they ever need. Um, translation services or if they know of anyone that does that's sort mm. of how I go about it or would go about it yeah I think it's a very useful strategy I mean uh, probably there is no such thing as a one fits all advice on converting no. uh, converting contacts into clients uh, it all, I think it all depends on uh, the type of clients you are looking for uh, what are they looking for? Okay, now we lost Mitri. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think we can uh, go back to the subject of our today's talk and talk about your speaking engagements and coaching business. Uh, did I get you right that it actually started with speaking engagements first? You said you started uh, doing mm -hmm. presentations in 2009 uh, via ATA. American mm -hmm. Translators Association. Can you tell a bit more about how it all started? So that's how it started. And I wasn't actively pursuing coaching. It was when people started asking me if I can help them. Mm -hmm. that I, and, and I saw that other, other people did it too, that I started offering coaching. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've been a mentor for several years for, for people in ATA. But I think mentoring and coaching are still two different things. Yes, yeah? yes. but um, we're sort of dealing with the same things, mm -hmm. with the same questions. So um, after being a mentor I, I and after being asked to help them and they would say, I, I will, can I pay you this and this? And mm -hmm. can you help me with this? Then I realized that I can do that too. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized that I was sort of coaching, I wouldn't call me as much a coach as a consultant. Mm -hmm. um, I, I consult on marketing strategies more than, than coaching people mm -hmm. in, in their business. Um, I guess they're a little bit interrelated, but I did take a coaching class online mm -hmm. for that. That was well. That's what I was going to ask you. Did you uh, have any special training to that you need to offer coaching services or co consulting services? Mm -hmm. Only so for my consulting, it's only my 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 experience mm. and my. My background, I have a, a, a degree in marketing, international marketing, and I had, have a degree in business communication and 
public relations. Mm -hmm. And for the sort of code, then I thought that, well, is this, this is sort of like coaching. So I did t take an, a, a, a course online. I think it was 13, 14 sessions online on coaching, just so mm -hmm. that I would know how to go about it. And who provided the course? Was it some special organization or... Where, I, found where was it? I, I found it online. <laughs> By, via the podcasting things. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah. It's a great because thing I, because, because I, I also noticed that we can actually learn, we, I mean translators, can learn quite a lot from uh, people from different industries, probably depending on what you want to do, what you want to focus on. I personally learn a lot from the so-called creative entrepreneur, entrepreneurs. I, I learn just a ton from there, also in terms of marketing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there, there is a, a true coach who has, uh, f who is really focusing on coaching in in England. Um, I I know her, and I've interviewed you mean, I, I, Christelle, probably, yes. Christelle, yeah. I've interviewed her on my podcast. So mm -hmm. so if 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 you would want pure coaching, then I recommend her. If you want consulting on, on we your have marketing. invited her i've been exchanging emails with her actually today and i okay. also learned about her from your podcast yes <laughs> it's, yes it's just amazing how it's all interconnected and and whether and if you want more like marketing and, and business um consulting and mentoring that's or then you use me so for example mm -hmm. i have a a coaching uh coaching sessions set up three sessions with a person now who wants to with my help create a marketing plan to find mm -hmm. direct clients so, so that's what i'm going to help her with mm. and that and that's basically uh, the problems that you help your clients coaching clients to solve yes they say or they say i want to change my client I want to reach these clients more or I want to develop my website and I want to develop my my resume that's what I help them with and I want to um, get started and I so th those are sort of the beginning but but the more advanced are how do I reach this type of client where do I find them how do I make a plan how do I find my how I'm unique mm. um, how can I communicate my value? Where should I start looking for them? How do I use social media? How do I uh, use my website? Hmm. Those kind of things. And would you say uh, your coaching clients are mostly newbie translators, the people who are just newcomers to this profession? Or do you have experienced translators who feel kind of lost and need help and guidance? It's both. I think I mentor more newbies as a mentoring and the coaching is more specific and they're more experienced they just know more specifically what they want help with hmm. and do you measure the results uh, uh like if you developed a marketing plan for uh, your coaching clients do you actually follow up about the results of this marketing plan or i follow up with the 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 customer or the client but it's mm -hmm. up to them to measure the results yeah because making the plan i think it's only the first step and mm -hmm. the, the most difficult part is to actually implement that plan and follow it mm -hmm. <laughs> i know mm -hmm. it from experience because i, I know have some, yeah. yes <laughs> some yes plans and uh, yeah but fo following through is the most difficult part mm-hmm mm -hmm. Do you also help with that, or would it be more uh, on the coaching side? So, so the the actual consulting and coaching is, um, you know, they they pay a special hourly fee. Mm -hmm. So I help with whatever I can, but 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 the best part about that is that they pay, and they invest in it. So then it's also they're more likely to actually do it and follow mm -hmm. through yeah do you understand what i mean yeah. sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. it is a great motivation when you when you pay for something or, or when mm -hmm. you get it for free 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So, but, so when they reach that stage, when they say, "Okay, I want to use her to to do this," then they are also very motivated and 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 take action. Mm. Yeah, sure. Would you say that uh, all your speaking about all of your side projects? Would you say that they somehow helped you in promoting your translation business, or is it? Uh, more separated from it and it's just something some other areas where you um i don't know make make help other people while also doing something different for a change and it's more more of that or probably making some connections with other translators how, how would I you I think it's very valuable for the networking aspect. Mm. So when people get to know me, if they ever hear about somebody that needs Swedish translation, they think of me because they've met me and they've heard about me. So in that respect, it helps. And, and vice versa. When the, I, I, if, if people are looking for some other translators, I tend to recommend those that I have met in person and that I know mm. about. Um, so, so in that way, it helps my business. And I sometimes meet mm, clients, but those are most, mostly agencies uh, during, through the speeching, speaking and, and the podcast and so forth. But what it's helped me most with is that um, I, I really enjoy helping the people and, and feel like I, I do help them and, and get the feedback and meet other people. So it's, it's a big motivational factor for me and a big, uh, an important sort of side thing that makes it more, even more fun to translate because I have the translation, but then I also have this. So I, it's sort of more complete mm. for me. And, uh, yeah. Interesting. That's that. And have you, have you, ever had, have you ever had any negative feedback about your side projects? Oh yes. I think everybody does. Um, I have, I, most people don't tell me I, but, uh, I do ask for always for feedback in, for the mm -hmm. podcast and, and I did get, uh, some negative feedback about the sound. And then I did, I hired somebody to actually go back and edit sound, edit all the previous podcasts, but, um, and yes, I guess, but, but most of it is just positive actually and that's what keeps me motivated and that's what keeps me going that would be actually i would be very surprised to hear that you had any other negative feedback apart from probably some technical th things like the sound because what you are doing is actually really helpful for other translators mm -hmm. so and your target audience uh, is actually translators as well so it would be strange to, 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 to get uh, any negative things, any negative feedback on that. Well, I think everybody have some trolls, especially yeah, when they are them. active online. Mm. Um, so, and, and, and for example, when I give webinars or presentations, it's not always going to be exactly right for everybody. Mm -hmm. So there's always like, if I am, if, if 99, 98% is positive, there's always someone, oh, it was too basic or it didn't cover this or, 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 or something like that. So, and that's just how it is. So how do you, yeah, how do you deal with the uh, trolls? Does it get to you or have you developed the uh, thicker skin? that uh, just helps you to ignore all of that I, when that happens i think i've developed thicker skins uh, i do mm. i take the, the the feedback into account for example the sound then i did, did go back to 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 try and improve the sound quality but there's only so much you can do with the resources you have uh, mm -hmm. and 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 i do encourage feedback for for from from presentations and webinars so that i can improve it if if possible. Uh, and then the positive feedback is just um, sort of insurance that since, since most of it is positive, positive, then, then, then it's all good. And 
I know what's working and, uh, and, and can improve what's not working in that case. I, I read a very interesting book the other day. It's called Hug Your Haters. I highly, mm -hmm. reco I highly recommend reading it to, uh, to everyone. It's more, it's more business focused. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more about dealing with customer complaints and how you can uh, deal with all kinds of haters. And they, they, they actually give a ton of advice and a, a lot of uh, real life examples. And some, some of the examples, you wouldn't believe what, what people might write about your business or about your ideas. Uh, some, some of them are, are hilarious. Some of them are terrifying. Uh, mm -hmm. but, it, uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's all about trying to understand uh, the, the feedback and just mm -hmm. trying to embrace it the way, the mm -hmm. way you can and just talk and acknowledge it. The most important part is just acknowledging that you received it and you try to do everything you can. I on it, I also think that the the translation and interpretation business, uh, at least I I'm a translator. I don't interpret, so that's what who I deal with the most. But I do think that we are kind of a, we are a very good we're good people. We're not focusing mm -hmm. on on criticizing others most of the time. I think that if yeah, probably. I quite agree, and it probably has something to do because uh, with the fact that we deal with different cultures mm -hmm. uh, in our work, so we are probably more accepting. And I would say that the majority of translators, they uh, not just know a language or can speak a language, but they also know the culture mm -hmm. and oftentimes love the culture, mm -hmm. uh, the different culture of uh, the language they uh, translate from mm -hmm. so prob so probably that's why we're so nice yes <laughs> yes yes and we all have bad days but but um, sure. we, if we have some some friends or colleagues that we can talk to them then then we do that but in, yeah. in general I have I have mostly received just positive feedback so uh, can you give some kind of advice to people who are not very active online who don't have any kind of side projects but would love to start one how how what can they do uh, and what mistakes they should avoid and something like that uh find something that you are passionate about that you care about and and start sharing that and find the forum to share it in by by looking at where other people that are interested in that are hanging out so to speak. So it doesn't actually uh, have to be something um, ve very closely related to translation, but uh, probably it would be an interesting idea to find something that could be connected with translation. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. when you started a uh, marketing tip for, for translators, uh, it was probably more about marketing than about translation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, I know other translators that so Valeria Aliperta have have a have sort of a, a page and a, a website about style, and I know another translator who who is blogging about her travels and and one who is sort of blogging and sharing about her health and yoga tips, so mm -hmm. fitness and so forth. I, I vote for more healthy tips. <laughs> I just, I just, I just really need that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you're probably talking about Sarah Colombo. Yes, she, yes. She's blogging. She's the, the healthy freelancer. Yes. You should, you should check her out, Dmitri, her, her blog. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I need more advice on uh, healthy last. I actually, <laughs> I, I joined the uh, uh, One Million Miles project by, uh, yeah, me too. by mm -hmm. Tiny Query. Uh, it, it really keeps me motivated. It's funny though because uh, I have a wife, and she she's supposed to be my 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 major motivator for keeping moving. But this project actually uh, works more for me. I don't know why. I don't know why uh -huh. it's happening. Maybe the the reason that I belong to this profession and I see other professionals of. Uh, uh, from my industry who are involved in this project and they promote healthy lifestyle and this keeps me motivated because i feel like i belong to this profession i also want to be uh, healthy and uh, and move more <laughs> than i and, do now 
And I live in a in a in a mountain town, and everybody's active here. Mm. Everybody. So I think that motivates me because most people are very active, and I, I, I do I I do a lot of yoga. I do I hike, I ski, I bike. I I, I used to run, but I'm my injury won't go away, so I I don't run right now, but. But um, it depends on where you live and, and who you associate with, I guess, Dimitri. You should hang out more with me. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> yeah. I also think that somehow other people are more motivating for me as well than the nearest and dearest because I know that the people who love me accept me as I am. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's, that, it's, it might be the case with you too because, yeah, you, and, you know that... Yeah, that, that spoils you. <laughs> yeah. And, and for, when it comes to, to eating healthy, that's sort of something I'm interested in and, and trying out and doing a lot. Um, when it comes to... But when it's, it's about exercise, I have done it so many years now. Mm. And so it's it's a habit for me. And I sort of get, I, I, I'm thinking better. I'm working better. I'm a nicer person if I have exercise that day. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. So uh, it was a very nice talking to you today, Tess. Uh, we had a, a very interesting conversation. I think we have a couple more minutes before we go offline if the members of our audience have uh, any kind of questions you can share them in the chat window uh there is a chat window on the right hand side uh, and you can ask tests any question you like <laughs> i will probably ask another question about uh, you talking about that you've been exercising for several years now <laughs> and with all your side projects and translation business and everything What's your most, uh, I think, practical, most uh, useful time management tip? Okay, so when it comes to exercise, I try to get it in in the morning if I can, because mm. the afternoons and evenings tend to get hectic with family. And, and, and if I do it in the morning, then I still know I have to translate, and that always get done, gets done. And the same thing with the marketing and, and my course and my bez my side projects. I do them first because I know I will not risk any deadlines and I know I will do the, 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 the translation anyway. But I don't let it go too long during the day for other projects. If I have a lot of translation work to do, then I cut, cut it off at a certain time. And... Um, I'm very much for to-do lists and planning my week and day. I have a, I can show you, I have a, a planner like this and I have the same online and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and so forth. And, and I'm very much for crossing off things and that helps. So you're a pen and paper person. I, I do have this online. I do have the same thing online, so I sort of double it up. And and mm -hmm. online, it's it's uh, it it syncs between my phone and my both computers. But then, if I also write it down and can cross it off, it sort of um, I don't know sticks better, or it feels better mm -hmm. to cross it off. Or so I actually see I have I had a, one of the course participants. I just checked out the the. Participants mm -hmm. and I people, have the people, yeah, the people who are watching us. That's what I also wanted to ask you. Could you tell us a bit more about the course? Because today is the first time I hear about it. Okay, okay. <laughs> That's because it's not publicly launched yet. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I had many people say that I could create a course based on the book. Mm. And then I sort of started surveying my audience and other people of what they were struggling and what they would need help with and, and looking at the questions I got and, and so forth and started collecting that. And uh, also on I, online, I learned about online courses and I know other people are doing it. And I knew I wanted to share marketing tips and, and I knew people had asked for more uh, practical, like 
do. Mm, hand, hands, hands on. on. Thing. Mm-hmm. So that's how I started developing the course, and based on the feedback I got, I I, I put in what what they wanted to 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 work on, but it is sort of based on my marketing book, and um, it's a it's a course with ten lessons or ten modules, and it's adapted to your situation. So if you're just starting out, you can focus on that section of certain cer- certain modules. And if you're more advanced, and then you focus on that part of the module. Um, and it sort of takes you step by step through the whole process um, of marketing your business from knowing really where you stand today to what you want to achieve and reach in the future. And so, yeah, so it's a video and presentation, video sort of screencast of a presentation, video with me. And there's always a worksheet for every module and there's a checklist for every module, at least one checklist. And you can download the audio and you can download the all the material and, and and a PDF. Hmm. That's how it looks. Awesome. And do you people use will get. Uh, yes, I, I, I use a, a WordPress website and a plugin mm-hmm. called Sippy Courses. Mm-hmm. And it basically it helps you build the whole course and mm-hmm. enroll students. Mm-hmm. I actually took a course on how to create a course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think there is a whole industry of uh, people who are teaching other people how to create courses. I think mm-hmm. Paul, Paul Jarvis, uh, Jason Zook, some of the people mm-hmm. who are very popular in this field. Mm-hmm. I'm also very, I'm, I'm just very curious about uh, the courses and how they work because uh, this seems like a very interactive way of uh, presenting your knowledge and sharing it with the uh, other translators. Mm-hmm. And I forgot to say that uh, in the end, the people get a uh, half an hour Q&A with me mm-hmm. based on the course. And they have forever access to it so they can go back and work on it. Mm. And Q&A is a, as in a chat session or as in an yes. e- so email? Yes, or a phone, f- phone call or chat session mm-hmm. or Skype session, whichever works. Cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, how how long uh, does it take to listen to or to view the modules? How how long are the modules? Um, if every... you mean the actual recording, they're not very long. They're about fifteen minutes to half an hour, depending mm-hmm. on what you focus on per per recording. But then you have the exercises and the material. Mm-hmm. And I I release one sort of lesson per week, but it is ten lessons. So I've uh, put two together so it's eight weeks but mm. this is eight weeks really drip the release but you can like I said always go back and if and have forever access if you don't have time to I know one of the participants are getting married during the course so he might not do anything that week or, or two <laughs> weeks <laughs> yeah. when are you planning to launch the course do you know the date already well, this is going to be now eight weeks and then all the feedback and then I, I will work on the course. So probably in the fall, I'm hoping mm. for September. Mm. Mm? Uh, and what kind of tools do you normally use both for podcasting, uh, making courses, uh, coaching and uh, managing your uh, translation business? What, what tools can you recommend? Like, what are you, uh, at least your five most favorite tools? Well, for translation, it's definitely my laptop. And uh, for as a dictionary resource, I use Word Finder, where I can combine all the my own dictionaries and uh, their dictionaries. So instead of having paper dictionaries these days or looking online, I use Word Finder. Um, I know there's also IntelliWeb search, um, and I, for translation tools, I use both MemoQ and SDL because I started with SDL studio long time ago. So that's what I'm most used to. 
I've also used WordPress. That's for my translation business, I guess. For my podcasting, I use a USB microphone that I plug in. And uh, um, the sound editing is Audacity and the uh, recording is Pamela. Mm, and I host the audio on Libsyn. It's called Libsyn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my website, I use website, web, WordPress and, and Bluehost or HostGator. Um, what else? You, you said a lot there. Is there any, anything that I forgot? What about managing your day-to-day -day activities like uh, apps for productivity or something like that? Uh, oh, I... The only thing I, I, so a few years ago, I, I did measure my time and where the time went and what projects mm -hmm. went faster and, and slower. And then I used tog, uh, toggle, mm -hmm. T O G G L dot com. But now I have, um, now I have a, a, a tool installed called rescue time. Mm -hmm. And um, sort of, it measures everything automatically. What I can see how much time I spend on email, how much time I spend in translation tools, how much time I spend on Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> and so forth. Um, and I can adjust those, and I see how much I've worked per week, and I know, and then I can compare it with the projects I've worked on to see see how much I've earned and what projects are fast and slow. So. But I don't use yet, at least. I might start using it with my virtual assistant. I don't use a project management tool or I don't mm -hmm. use um, – I'm, I've signed up for a course for uh, – oh, there's a project management tool that everybody's using. Not Translator? Translator something? Or is it not for translation? No, it's not for translation. It's you, you. It's sort of a task tool, and you can move the Trello. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. Trello. Yeah, that's what we are using for blabbing translators. We are using mm -hmm. it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's super handy. Yes. So I I don't know enough about it. So maybe you guys can teach me about that. Sure. Yeah. Maybe I. If you, I, have, if you have any questions, <laughs> we'll be happy to help. But well, I am having Dmitri on the on the podcast so maybe i can have you elena you can talk on and talk about trello for translators yeah sure why not that mm -hmm. would be great mm -hmm. we'll figure out the date <laughs> yes yes yeah. oh. all right all settled then <laughs> okay okay uh so uh we are almost at one hour mark this is where we normally uh gonna end our blab it was a uh, it was very nice talking to you today, Tess. Uh, uh, we learned a great deal about you, uh, all your side projects. Uh, uh, I hope uh, this blab would inspire people to be more active and follow their passions and just uh, try something new and uh, kind of build something unique that they would enjoy and something that will bring value to their community, just like you're doing with podcasts, courses, books, and all all other work. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. It was a, a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you. It was a pleasure being here. So, and thank you everybody for tuning in. Yeah. Uh, if you are miss, if you missed this blab, or if you had to go somewhere and make a coffee or something, uh, there's going to be a recording. So uh, we're going to upload it to YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes. So. Uh, you will be able to watch it uh, probably on Sunday. Yes, is that right, Elena? Yeah. Yeah. We send so, out yeah. our weekly email on Sundays. Yes. So please uh, go to our website. It's called blabbintranslators.com. Uh, sign up for our mailing list. Um, that way, you will never miss another episode. You will be able to join us uh, and talk to our guests in real time, ask questions, and have a lot of fun. <laughs> it was fun. Thank you, and thank you for the questions. Yeah, thank, thank you so you much for, for watching. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much for watching, guys, and have a lovely day. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.